For as the light of the morning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, and covereth the whole earth, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Therefore sanctify yourselves, that your minds become single to God, and the days will come that you shall see him. For he will unveil his face unto you, and it shall be in his own time, and in his own way, and according to his own will. This is Unveiling Jesus Christ. Welcome to this podcast on Unveiling Jesus Christ. I'm John Cassinet, and today we continue our discussion of the sixth seal in Revelation chapter 6. This follows my previous podcasts that talk about the signs and wonders that bring an end to the sixth seal that include the great earthquake in Revelation chapter 6 verses 12 and 13, and then all these signs in heaven, including the darkened sun, a red moon, and the falling stars, in Revelation chapter 6, verse 14. We now see the reaction of the wicked people at the end of the sixth seal as these calamities and these signs and these wonders occur. For the nutshell version of this podcast, you can check out section 64 in my book. Revelation chapter 6 verses 15 and 16 that we'll be talking about today describe the seven classes of wicked men that hide in fear. These are listed in verse 15 as follows, quote, And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. Close quote. John uses the symbolic number seven in this discussion, and this is a number, of course, that represents completeness and the universal number. You can get more information about numerology, including the meaning of the number seven, if you go back and take a look at my Come Follow Me podcast number five on October 29. Of 2023. So he uses this number seven by listing seven earthly and heavenly parts that are affected by the signs and wonders. So you have three elements of the earth that include the earth, every mountain, and every island. That's what's being affected at the end of the sixth seal from a physical standpoint. Then you have the number four that is the other part of the number seven, so three plus four together equals seven. Well, the four parts are the heavens that include the sun, the moon, and the stars. So we've got all of that relating to the earth and the heavens. And then we have these seven classes of men, including kings, great men, rich men, chief captains, mighty men, bond men, free men, all of whom symbolically represent the whole class of all wicked people that will exist on the earth as the sixth seal comes to an end. So the two forms of his using the number seven, both with regard to things that are physical and then things of the classes of wicked people, emphasize that there is no place that is unaffected and no class of persons that is untouched. Let's talk about the identities of these seven classes of wicked men, and I hasten to include women. I'm sure somewhere you're in there, even though we talk about these wicked men. It's really something where we're speaking somewhat generically and somewhat universally. So we begin, first of all, with the kings of the earth. These are worldly rulers, not just world rulers. We might have some pretty good world rulers out there, but these are intended to designate worldly rulers. They include political leaders, civic officers, officials, statesmen, corrupt politicians. Bruce R. McConkie gives this description of the kings generally saying, quote, earthly kings rule and reign by man's power and not by divine right. Their thrones, in the first instance, were set up by the power of the sword and are bathed in blood and shall tremble to the earth and shall tumble to the earth when the Almighty makes a full end of all nations, close quote. Joseph Fielding McConkie adds to that description saying, quote, All earthly kings, potentates, and princes have temporary and limited power and authority, 
which is both localized and limited to the extent of their kingdom. But there is one king who holds unlimited power, whose boundaries know no limits, and whose authority is from everlasting to everlasting. This is Jesus Christ, who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Close quote. In addition to the kings of the earth, we then have the second group, which is designated by John or identified by him as great men. These would include influential people in society that bring about evil. It can include any political and non-political person or people in power. It could be the media types, including the organizations they control. So think a little bit about where you get your news. And the news outlets, you'll see them today divided ideologically. We don't have any balance. There really is no objectiveness in the news reporting these days. So you have these right-leaning, you have the left-leaning, anti this way, anti that way. And so if I listen to one outlet, I pretty much know what I'm going to hear and what slant they're going to place on things. So you just know about all of these things. But we're here talking about news outlets and these individuals called great men that could also include secret combinations, including their devotees. So these are not great in the sense of good. These are great in the sense of their evil power and their ability to control for things that are bad throughout the world. The great men are described elsewhere by John in connection with the fall of Babylon. In Revelation 18.23, for example, it states, quote, And the voice of the bridegroom and of the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee, for thy merchants were the great men of the earth, for by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Close quote. So if we add to the list of merchants people who traffic in evil merchandise, who control markets, who are profiteers, and by this I mean to say those kinds of people who, when you have a major disaster, are going to double their prices, triple or quadruple their prices, they're price gougers. There's the old saying that these types of people kick people while they're down. So when we think of these, we're contemplating the idea of humanitarian aid assistance and deliveries. And you hear about people who skim off the top and organizations have this bloated overhead such that little aid gets ultimately to the victims who they're supposedly serving. When we're talking about great men, we're talking about all of these kinds of peoples that are included as merchants within the context of the definition of modern Babylon. And this concept of great men is a very large class of people who are motivated by greed and power and pride. They include anyone that has these kinds of anti-Christian qualities who have and yield and wield worldly influence, power, and control. So they could include religious people. And I think about when I was growing up, uh, you hear a lot about these televangelists who encourage people and play on their sympathies and their weaknesses and to, all to just basically get money. These are the type of people that were described in Second Nephi 26, 29, where it says, quote, He commandeth that there shall be no priestcrafts, for behold, priestcrafts are that men preach and set themselves up for a light unto the world, that they may get gain and praise of the world, but they seek not the welfare of Zion." Close quote. So that's another class that I think we would have to put in this category of being mighty men or great men that we're here talking about. The next category, the third category, is going to be the rich men. This consists of wealthy people who are filled with pride and who care not for the poor. So it's more than just people that have money, because we've heard the old saying, the love of money is the root of all evil. So it's not just the fact that you have money that makes you wicked or an evil person, but it's your love of money that becomes the root of evil. It's what you do with the money that distinguishes rich men, as described in this verse, from other people who happen to be wealthy and have money at their disposal. Now, King Jackson spoke of this group when he said, quote, Jesus taught 
It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Our perceptions and our experience tell us that camels cannot go through the eye of a needle. What hope is there then for rich men to enter the kingdom of God? In the Joseph Smith translation of Matthew 19 and 26, as well as others, all clarify that the impossibility refers not to those who have riches, but to those who trust in riches. Mark's account reads, with men that trust in riches, it is impossible, but not impossible with men who trust in God and leave all for my sake, for with such all things are possible. Close quote. We also learn from Doctrine and Covenants, section 56, verse 16, the following, which says, quote, Woe unto you rich men that will not give your substance to the poor, for your riches will canker your souls, and this shall be your lamentation in the day of visitation, and of judgment, and of indignation. The harvest is past, the summer is ended, and my soul is not saved. Close quote. Likewise, in Micah 6.12, it states, quote, For the rich men thereof are full of violence, and the inhabitants thereof have spoken lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. Close quote. This statement in Micah is kind of a commentary on how the riches were obtained by those who come into this category of rich men. And you can see that if you're obtaining wealth through violence and other illicit means that are unlawful in some respect, then that would put you in the category of being someone who is a rich man. In Second Nephi 28.15, it also says, quote, O the wise and the learned and the rich that are puffed up in the pride of their hearts, and all those who preach false doctrines, and all those who commit whoredoms, and pervert the right way of the Lord, Woe, woe, woe be unto them, saith the Lord God Almighty, for they shall be thrust down to hell. Close quote. So here we have the group of the wise, the learned, and the rich who are puffed up in pride, all falling into this category of being rich men. Rich not just in the sense of money, but in possessions, in honors, distinctions. These are prideful people who are rich in their own vanity and their view of themselves. The fourth category we have are the chief captains. These are military commanders over armies that fight against God and goodness. They're commanders of armies who are inspired by evil motives, and they carry out evil and wicked purposes. This is reflected by way of example in Alma 43, verse 6 and 44. It says, quote, And now, as the Amalekites were of a more wicked and murderous disposition than the Lamanites were, in and of themselves, Therefore Zarahemna appointed chief captains over the Lamanites, and they were all Amalekites and Zoramites, and they were inspired by the Zoramites and the Amalekites, who were their chief captains and leaders, and by Zarahemna, who was their chief captain, or their chief leader and commander. Yea, they did fight like dragons, and many of the Nephites were slain by their hands, yea, for they did smite in two many of their headplates, and they did pierce many of their breastplates, and they did smite off many of their arms, and thus the Lamanites did smite in their fierce anger. Close quote. So this is a pretty good illustration of this concept of the chief captains, those who were chosen from among the Lamanites because of their murderous disposition. Now I have to make a confession that I was in the Marine Corps and I was a captain. Hopefully I wasn't a chief captain. You know, we have this kind of running joke in our family because my daughter Jamie is a captain in the Air Force and so I'm always telling her, well, a captain in the Air Force is really pretty much the equivalent of a corporal in the Marine Corps. <laughs> So I know I just offended everyone in the chair force. I mean the Air Force. I'm just teasing. So at any rate, so I know something about these chief captains because uh, I was in the military and have an appreciation for the orders that are given. I'm also reminded of the, uh, the movie A Few Good Men that I saw many years ago. 
I think uh, it's probably an R-rated movie, but I remember seeing it as a kid, and it starred Tom Cruise and Kevin Bacon. And then you also had Jack, you can't handle the truth, Nicholson, right? So Kevin Bacon was uh, a Marine Corps judge advocate prosecutor, which is essentially the job that I did when I was in the Marine Corps. I was a judge advocate also. So that's what I did. I tried over 100 courts martial during my active duty career, although none of them occurred down at Gitmo. I was always stationed down at Camp Pendleton in Southern California. And so you've got uh, Kevin Bacon, who's the prosecutor, and you got Tom Cruise, who's a lieutenant in the Navy JAG. He's representing a couple of enlisted men involved in a Code Red, which was essentially a form of extrajudicial punishment that ended up in the death of one of their victims. And so they were just carrying out the Code Red orders. It ends up, somebody ends up dying, and now they're on trial for murder. Tom is trying to get them off the hook by getting Nicholson, who's a full bird colonel, to admit that he ordered the code red. So that's when Tom Cruise is essentially putting the screws to Jack Nicholson, who's on the stand, and uh, they're going back and forth. And finally, Nicholson admits, I ordered the code red. And he's like the uh, epitome of the chief captain who is making these illegal orders in a wartime condition. So would be anyone else who acts illegally in the war. Of course, as soon as Nicholson admits that he ordered the code red, then uh, these young Marines think, well, now I'm off the hook because now we know I was ordered to do this. But it turns out, no, you're not off the hook because even soldiers who perform illegal actions based on an illegal order, you're still doing wrong. And so this idea of a chief captain being limited to only people in high command that are ordering unlawful actions, it extends down to basically anyone who acts illegally in war. And we see it all the time. It's not like we just have these head honchos that would qualify for this. So that's a little bit about chief captains. And We're going to see a lot of that because we live in a time of war and it's going to continue to be a very pervasive problem as we continue to march toward the end of the sixth seal and into the seventh seal. The fifth category or class of wicked people is the category that John calls the mighty men. These are strong, powerful men who dominate in other wicked ways that we haven't already talked about. These are evil people who follow or adhere to the slogan that might makes right. So the Greek word in some of the Greek manuscripts read istiroi, which means strong physically. But really this is a general category of evil men that includes those from the categories found in other groups. And so uh, you have to understand it's not like there's this bright line that exists between these groups. And probably John is trying to identify groups generally that are intended to make an expression about the representative nature of the groups, a certain level of symbolism. Are these groups all groups that truly will exist as evil classes of people as we approach the end of the sixth seal? The answer is yes. But are they also intended to convey a symbolic message by the fact that there is seven of them, even though they kind of have these crossovers between them? And the answer is yes, again. You have to consider the symbolism associated with the seven, as well as the distinctions between each of the seven, coupled with the crossovers between them. We then come to the sixth category, which is every bond man. Now, this relates to physical bondmen and spiritual bondmen, that is, those who are servants of sin. So when you think of the physical bondmen, the idea of slaves and slavery come immediately to mind. And that's because there was a large class of people in the Roman Empire at the time the book of Revelation was written. Just because they happen to be slaves does not mean they are exempt from those qualities and attributes in their lives who would qualify them as wicked people. And these can be among those who will be in fear of the wickedness that exists in their lives. So John's intent is necessarily inclusive because 
they are people who can qualify to be wicked in their own right. And we know that it could and does include bondmen or slaves because the next category that John chooses is the category of free men. But the real point is not so much about the physical bondage. It's not just the fact that they are slaves qualifies them to be listed among a class of people who are considered to be wicked. They're not wicked just because they are slaves, because they are servants, because they are of a lower class. That's not what puts them in the category of wickedness, just the same way as the fact that people who have money don't necessarily automatically fall into the class of rich men. It's all about what you do with your money. It's all about what you do as a person who is in bondage to other people. So many people in physical bondage won't be filled with pride. They won't be wicked people, but if they live their lifestyle, even as a bondman or a servant in a sense of wickedness, then they're going to fall into that category. And of course, we're really talking about the spiritual bondmen who are at risk because they are slaves to wickedness and they are slaves to evil. That's the real essence of the people who are considered bondmen who are going to cower in the face of the signs and events at the end of the sixth seal. The seventh category of men are free men. And this category is kind of the opposite of bondmen. It means that they're free, but that also means that they freely choose a wicked course of life for themselves. This is used by John to contrast with bondmen so that you have to understand no one is left out. You're either free or you're in bondage. It's universal. And all of the classes of people, whether they be high and low, will be filled with fear. So spiritually, these are people who have the agency and who have a reason to fear because they essentially choose evil. Victor Ludlow said this, quote, If we are free to choose between good and evil after the laws of God have been given to us, then we are free to receive either the blessings and joy for our obedience or the punishment and misery for our disobedience. Freedom of choice does not mean freedom from consequences. Close quote. It's significant to note, having gone through all seven classes of the wicked and unrepentant people at the end of the sixth seal, that all of these classes are those that hide in fear. You have to notice these aren't groups of people that are going to be destroyed at the end of the sixth seal. These are all people who are going to be spiritually unprepared for the destruction around them at the end of the sixth seal, but they're not going to die. This is not a circumstance where the wicked are destroyed. This is a circumstance where the wicked are being warned of the need to make changes in their lives. And if they remain spiritually unprepared, they're gonna have some real problems. Charles Ellicott in 1905 said this, quote, the terror strikes into every class, monarchs and their advisors, the statements and diplomats, the commanders of troops, the merchant princes, the men of ability, as well as the obscure orders of society. Neither royalty, nor rank, nor force of arms, nor opulence, nor talent, nor strength, either of intellect or frame, avail in that crisis. Neither does insignificance escape in that day when God brings to light the hidden things. The tests of God are spiritual, as the weapons of God's war are not carnal. Men who have relied upon wealth, rank, or power, have prepared themselves against one form of trial, but find themselves unarmed in the day of spiritual testing." Close quote. So that's a little bit about uh, these seven classes of wicked people, and now we're going to find out what they do as these disasters and these great signs and wonders occur as the sixth field comes to an end. And this we find in Revelation 6 verse 15, which says, these hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. This means essentially that when the seven final signs of the sixth seal occur, 
these seven classes of wicked people will seek spiritual refuge in the most unlikely of places. They are hiding in places symbolized by dens of wild beasts. So this den is a lair of wild beasts or a hole of a venomous reptile. The, we're talking here about the recesses of caves, the coverings and fissures in the rocks that offer secret hiding places. It's the resort of thieves. When we had the first Jewish war that began in 66 AD, when the Romans were coming in after the rebellions of the Jews, the Jews would take resorts into these caves in any place they could in these high mountains. For example, in the area of the Sea of Galilee, Mount Arbel, where they have these caves. And in order for the Romans to conquer the Jews, they would actually make themselves these baskets where they could lower themselves down over the cliffs and fight the Jewish families and Jewish individuals who were back in these little cavernous openings in the uh, mountain. And so these are some of the places where you kind of think about uh, what we're talking about here. But the idea of hiding from their wickedness in the face of the calamities and signs and wonders at the end of the sixth seal only makes their spiritual condition even worse. They're hiding in dangerous places where, symbolically speaking, there are wild animals and snakes who would cause their death. The rocks of the mountains mentioned in this verse are something that pose the greatest physical danger during an earthquake. So it basically is telling us that as we approach the end of the sixth seal and you've got these seven classes of wicked people, they're going to act irrationally to avoid the wrath of God. We can compare this to Isaiah chapter 2, verses 19 and 21, which says, quote, And they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. In that day, a man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship, to the moles and to the bats, to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Close quote. If these people were simply afraid for the physical conditions like the great earthquake that will occur at the end of the sixth seal, then they would run out into an open space and find the most open space that they could find where there was nothing around them that could possibly fall on them and crush them. But since we're talking about people who are engaging in acts of spiritual self-preservation when they are wicked, these kinds of self-protective measures are going to do them no good. The only safe place is repentance. That's where you're out and you're open, where the Lord can see you and where you can kind of come clean, right? You, you, your life is then an open book. But for the people unwilling to do that, it's like, I'm going to hide myself in the most dangerous possible place that can exist on a spiritual level. If we go now to Revelation chapter 6, verse 16, it says about those people who are trying to hide themselves in these locations, the following, quote, And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. Close quote. This language and imagery comes from Hosea chapter 10, verse 8, which says, quote, The high places also of Avon, the sin of Israel, shall be destroyed. The thorn and the thistle shall come up on their altars, and they shall say to the mountains, Cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. Close quote. Christ similarly spoke of calamities at his second coming when he said in Luke 23 verses 29 through 30, quote, For behold, the days are coming, in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bear, and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. Close quote. The language in these verses denotes a certain consternation and an awful fear of God's impending wrath. Job 34, 22 also tells us, quote, There is no darkness, nor shadow of death, 
where the workers of iniquity may hide themselves. Close quote. Essentially, the wicked will find no consolation or security in the dens and in the rocks of mountains. The falling rocks that crush the wicked will not bring them any solace or comfort. Their pain, their agony, and their consternation, of course, is spiritual, and it will continue with them even if the rocks and mountains did actually crush them to death. In Doctrine and Covenants, section 29, verse 17, it says, quote, And it shall come to pass, because of the wickedness of the world, that I will take vengeance upon the wicked, for they will not repent. For the cup of mine indignation is full. For behold, my blood shall not cleanse them if they hear me not. Close quote. J. Perry asks, quote, Will people attempt to hide themselves from God? Three times Isaiah states that they will do so because of their fear of the Lord. Which fear is due to their wickedness and its consequences? Similarly, after their transgression, Adam and Eve also hid themselves from God. Close quote. This is a concept that is not difficult for us to grasp. We've all sinned. We've all had feelings of guilt. But couple this feeling with the physical calamities that then seem to be aimed at you. I remember an experience I had when I was at law school at the University of Wyoming. I was in the, the stacks of the library when there was this earthquake that hit. It was just a small earthquake of three to three and a half magnitude on the Richter scale. So it was nothing major, but the epicenter was close enough that I could really feel it. This was the first time I was in an earthquake and there's nothing like it. If you haven't been in an earthquake, you just can't really imagine what it must feel like to feel your whole earth kind of shaking below you. But I'll tell you what, it was enough of a shaking that if I'm ever in something like a six plus earthquake, something we would consider to be significant, I'm probably gonna be freaking out. So here we are at the end of the sixth seal, we're gonna have this great earthquake that's going to happen. And so here I, who I like to think I'm doing pretty good in terms of my spirituality, I'm, I'm hopefully not one of the seven classes of wicked people. And so I'm not that fearful in that sense of my life, but when that big earthquake comes, I'm going to be freaking out <laughs> because it's going to be a major thing. But at least I won't be freaking out from a spiritual standpoint. Those who are wicked and have reason to be concerned about their spirituality, they're going to have to face both situations of the physical calamities that are freaking them out and recognizing that, oh, I've been warned about this, and then what are they going to do? Joseph Seiss has said, quote, But the chief consternation arises not simply from the outward facts, but from the unwelcome conclusions which they force upon the soul. The physical manifestations may be in the line of physical laws and in no way contrary to them, but whether miraculous or not, they are so terrific and divine that they compel the most atheistic to see in them the hands and arms and utterances of a being transcendently greater still and to feel the demonstration in their souls that he has verily risen up in the fierceness of just indignation against long neglect and defiance of his authority. Close quote. And so that's what the people face who fall into one of these seven categories in addition to the consternation that comes from the physical. So you have essentially these wicked classes of people who are crying for the mountains and the rocks to crush them to death when they should be crying to God. The wicked, some more and some less, will apprehend that God is the instrumentality of these calamities. It's just going to be so obvious as we get to the end of the sixth seal that you can't help yourself but know that. But these wicked people are so prideful. I'm reminded a little bit of the old sitcom called All in the Family. It starred Carol O'Connor as Archie Bunker. One day Archie gets locked in the basement and the, the entire episode is pretty much spent with him in the basement. And finally, he decides he's going to say a prayer about having the Lord help him get out. And it went something like this. He says, Lord, 
I've never bothered you before, and I promise I won't do so again. And then he goes on to ask that the Lord get him out of the basement. And that's the way so many people are. You know, when the going gets tough, okay, I'll shoot up a prayer and then I won't bother the Lord anymore. Another example that I think about when I think about pride of the seven classes of wicked people is from a movie called Lorna Doone. This movie was set in England around the 1600s or 1700s, and it begins with this guy by the name of Carver Doone, who's a young man who kills the father of John Ridd, who was a young boy at the time. And so then after Carver kills John Ridd's father, the young John Ridd meets this young girl by the name of Lorna Doon. Well, it turns out that she's the supposed daughter of this guy by the name of Sir Ensor Doon, who is Carver's grandfather. And by the way, Lorna is supposed to marry the murderous Carver, whom she hates. So here we have the the love triangle because she's in love with John, Carver's in love with her, uh, he's J- John is in love with Lorna, blah, blah, blah. Love triangle. So the two of them grow up and lots of conflict. I won't tell you about the whole movie. But at the end of the movie, John is getting married to Lorna and a jealous Carver breaks into the church during the marriage ceremony and shoots Lorna. It's this kind of, if I can't have her, nobody can have her. And then after shooting Lorna, he runs away and John is chasing him into a bog, fight, fight, fight. And Carver ends up falling in this bog and in this quicksand mire and he's slowly sinking. And so here you have this uh, conflicted John Ridd. And he's just, oh, this is the guy that I hate. This is the guy that just shot my wife to be. Uh, and he's conflicted because he's basically a good guy, right? And so John reaches his hand out to save Carver, who's sinking into the bog. And as John reaches out to save him, Carver pushes back with his hand and then sinks her. And his whole face, you got this mud just kind of coming over his face like this, you know? He just disappears into the bog. And so this carver is the wicked poster child of the rich men, the chief captains, the mighty men. I mean, you roll them all together and you have Carter Dune, who's the poster child. And he would rather die sinful than accept the hand of mercy. He would rather face his maker filled with pride than remorse. And so that's why that movie kind of reminds me of what we're talking about with these seven classes of wicked people. Revelation 6.16 also states specifically that these seven classes of men want to be hidden, quote, from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. So again, this is a statement that the wicked in this verse would rather die than face God who sitteth on the throne. Now, Warren Wearsby explained this condition as follows, saying, quote, The people mentioned here are impenitent. They refuse to submit to God's will. They would rather hide from God in fear than run to him in faith. They are proof that judgment by itself does not change the human heart. Not only will men seek to hide from God, but they will blaspheme him as well. Close quote. The wrath of God mentioned in this verse is God's response to wrongs and injustices that are done by these seven classes of wicked people. Wrath, in the sense of God's wrath, includes anger, indignation, vexation, vengeance, and deep-seated emotion. Now, God's wrath is always holy, and it is always justified. Matthew Henry explained this, saying, quote, Though Christ be a lamb, yet he can be angry, even to wrath. And the wrath of the lamb is exceedingly dreadful. For if the Redeemer that appeases the wrath of God himself be our wrathful enemy, where shall we have a friend to plead for us? Those perish without a remedy who perish by the wrath of the Redeemer. So keep in mind that John is writing to an ancient audience 
with a great deal of Jewish tradition and learning. Anciently, the rabbis taught that order in the universe depended on obedience to God. When humans are so wicked as to set up their own system against God's, the constellations essentially abandon their harmony and the universe begins to fall apart and you have chaos. So this imagery that John is talking about here, about the wrath of the Lamb, is imagery that speaks to the ancient Jewish mindset. It impresses upon them the need to repent, to abandon evil, and to turn to God. Well, today, the world has a spiritually calloused mindset. No one believes that personal righteousness is going to have any effect on the planets and keeping them in their order. And yet, at the end of the sixth seal, the wickedness will be so great that there will be these seven signs in the earth and heaven as a voice of warning to them saying exactly that. If you don't clean up your act, this is what's going to happen and you will not be able to stand. We do not sin in a vacuum. Evil will not cause the great earthquake, but it will invoke the wrath of God and his displeasure. And yes, in his wrath, he controls the elements that no one can hide from. So these are all things that need to keep in mind. Keep in mind also that the end of the sixth seal is the first and most mild of several great days of wrath that will occur by the time of the second coming. Survivors of the first great day of wrath must repent or face the next day of wrath. The next day of wrath consists of the seven trumpet plagues that begin in chapter 8 of the book of Revelation. And there is this certain order of destruction that will exist, defined by the wickedness of those who are destined to be destroyed. So the first day of wrath is part of a selection process that's going to define who you are. It's a moment of choice for people to be able to say, yeah, I'm going to make a change in my life. I've been wicked up to this point, but I'm going to change. And for others, it's obviously going to harden them in their position. And so some people will repent, others will rebel in the face of increasing knowledge about the signs of the times and the surety that they are divine in their nature. Some of these will rebel and act in direct contravention of a great deal of light that they will have in their lives to the point that they become sons of perdition. And eventually they're going to be the first people as a group to be destroyed by the end of the second woe. And then you're going to have a destruction of celestial worthy people who are less wicked than these sons of perdition, but not sufficiently righteous to be able to survive the perils and the calamities and destructions of the third woe. The wrath of the Lamb of God imagery seems almost internally inconsistent, if not paradoxical, because here we have this lamb, and we think about as something that is innocent and lovable and cuddly, and yet in this context we're told that the lamb is full of wrath. This is based upon Christ's justice in the judgments that are rooted in his atoning sacrifice as a lamb of God. Warren Wearsby explained the consistency of the imagery between a lamb and wrath in this way. Quote, the phrase wrath of the lamb seems a paradox. Wrath of the lion would be more consistent. We are so accustomed to emphasizing the meekness and gentleness of Christ that we forget his holiness and justice. The same Christ who welcomed the children also drove the merchants from the temple. God's wrath is not like a child's temper tantrum or punishment meted out by an impatient parent. God's wrath is the evidence of his holy love for all that is right and his holy hatred for all that is evil. Close quote. Hate is a term that sounds harsh and we don't often associate it with Jesus Christ or the wrath of Christ. But if you take a look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 6, Christ's own voice 
describes the hatred he has of evil when he was speaking to the Ephesian saints and said, quote, But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Close quote. So there you have the Savior himself expressing his hatred of the wickedness of the Nicolaitans, and it's going to be no different at the end of the sixth seal. He will have hatred for sin in our future, just as he had a hatred of sin in the past. Consider also the words of Joseph XL, who said, quote, There is something of appalling significance in so paradoxical an expression as this, of the wrath of the Lamb. It makes the wrath trebly potent, that it should be wrath, long suppressed, but at length discharged, of a nature essentially and exceptionally meek, patient, long-suffering, easy to be entreated, hard to be angered, close quote. That's the sense of what we're looking at as we go toward the end of the sixth seal. The Savior has put off his exercise of judgments until he is certain that everyone has had a chance to see the signs of the times and to recognize the need to repent in their lives and to put their lives in order. And if they fail to do so, they are doing so against the increasing light that is conveyed to them through the voices of warning of God's servants and then the second voice of warning through the physical elements and calamities will occur with increasing frequency and fervency as we approach the end of the sixth seal. That concludes our podcast for today. We have one more podcast that's going to cover the last verse in Revelation chapter 6 that asks the question, who shall be able to stand? So here in this podcast, we've talked about all of the wicked, the seven classes of them that are not going to be able to stand. And what John is now going to ask in this last verse in Revelation 6 is, Essentially, if all of those guys are cowering in fear in the rocks and crevices and asking the mountains to fall on them, who then are we talking about are going to be those that have confidence in their ability to stand against the trials and tribulations and calamities that will exist at the end of the sixth seal and as we move into and continue with the calamities that will exist during the seventh seal. We'll look forward to being together again. Thanks for watching, listening, subscribing, and sharing, and to Jenna for all her support technically, and I will see you for our final discussion of the last verse in Revelation chapter 6.